right. Okay, so uh, I mean, his background range from uh, sport education to business. And today he's going to be unpacking what it means to actually speak with uh, Kendall and Ken. Uh, make sure that you are in the right breakout room. Okay, so uh, for now, I'm just going to hand it over back to uh, Kendall. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Shen, and thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Good to have you here. Uh, around a topic that just keeps coming up, you know, in my work, uh, one of the first things I look at when I go into work in an organization is are they talking, are they speaking the truth to each other? When you go to a meeting, is what they're saying in the meeting the same as what they're saying outside the meeting? Um, and it's, it's like a kind of a good indicator of the health of a group if the group are able to talk to each other openly. Um, in, in many groups you work in though, the group doesn't sort of quite have permission to speak openly. Uh, and so then the decisions that the group make together are often made on on, on, on inferences, on guesses, on, on, on data that you're not certain about. Uh, uh, Jack Welch, the, the business leader in America, said, the team that sees the truth clearest generally wins. The team that sees the truth clearest generally wins, you know, in, in organizations. Um, and it's tricky. When they study leaders in Australia and New Zealand, hundreds of thousands of leaders, what they find is that the behavior that troubles leaders, the behavior of all the things they study that they find most significant is that in leadership in Australia and New Zealand, there's a tendency to try and avoid saying what really needs to be said. There's a tendency to just try and work around things, to hint rather than to deal with stuff. Uh, and Australia and New Zealand are fairly forthright countries. Uh, but there's still a tendency in, in leaders not to say what needs to be said. When you ask leaders about that, what they'll often say is, I just want to be a nice guy, I want to be a nice woman, I just want to, you know, these are people I care about, I don't know how to be direct and caring. And if I feel like if I'm being direct that I'm sort of signaling that I don't care sometimes, um, but of course leaders know that if I'm signaling care all the time and I'm not being direct, that's not fair to the group either. So the, the dilemma is there in leadership. How do you speak front foot, cricket? How do you come forward and say what needs to be said without harming or damaging relationships? But let's, just a, last October I got a call from the Wallabies, you know, the Australian rugby team? So to come and work with them, they're stuck in the middle of the World Cup quarterfinals against England now. Uh, so I got a call from the Wallabies, come and work with them. And they were talking about what they wanted me to do. And I couldn't quite get the center of gravity of the proposal. And I said to the fellow uh, on the other end of the phone, I said, look, what's the core issue for you? What do you want me to come in and work on? And he said, we don't know how to have adult conversation. We don't know how to talk as adults. Uh, and if you can think about rugby as a sport, how tough they are, how courageous they are, like how physically courageous they have to be to play that sport at that level. So it's not a courage issue in many ways. Uh, it's just that they don't have the skills to keep that courage in their interpersonal relationships that they know they need uh, to underpin great performance. You have to have truth and courage in the organization. If we can't talk to each other, we're not going to work with each other that well. So this is the sort of background to why I would put a, a session like this together. Hey guys, please feel free to interrupt. You won't be interrupting me. I'd much rather if you have a question or a comment or a clarification, you're not stopping, you won't be interrupting me. I'd be really happy to hear that as we go along. And there'll be times in, the, in this session where I'll ask you just to chat to the people next to you and just to make some sense. Be careful what you hear from me because I can only speak from my experience. You know, I, I don't come into the room neutral. I come into the room with my assumptions I come into the room with my experience. I come into the room with, with my beliefs about the world. And some of the things I say to you will come from that place. And they may not be your assumptions or beliefs or, or thoughts about the world. So please feel free to clarify uh, because uh, this is not my session, it's yours. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's my session, well, what's that? It's actually meant to be your session. So what you can take from this is the important thing. What I, what I say. 
There aren't recipes for this because we're dealing with a very flexible, human nature is so fluid and flexible that if I could just say to you, here are the 10 things you need to know, it's a recipe. But of course, a recipe doesn't work in, in the truth of the situation is always more complex than the recipe. So um, if I could just say, here are the 10 top tips, you know, you could read that in a book. But we all know that that won't match the context you end up dealing with in a difficult conversation. You might know somebody that you care about that you have to say difficult things to. And that changes things. The recipe will change there. Um, it might be somebody who's senior to you that you have to have a difficult conversation with. And power will change that. And so recipes, I want to talk today more about approaches. How would you approach these conversations? And then, and also about how do you approach them internally inside yourself? How do you get yourself ready to have one of these conversations? So, and I'm taking you as proficient people. Like you're clever people, you're experienced people, you know lots of things already. Uh, and so if I was just to give you a recipe, I could have just handed that out. So it won't be like that in this session. I'd like you to have a thought first. As we come in here, what are your questions about how to have difficult conversations? You know, when you in your leadership life have to step forward and say to someone, maybe someone you care about, someone that you have to have a relationship with, that that behavior is not okay. We, we can't do that. That will not work for us. We have to stop doing that. So when you have to have that, you know, deliver a message to somebody that you care about, that you're going to end up working with, that the relationships with that person matter, what are your questions as you think of yourself in that situation where you have to come forward and say, no, stop, enough, we don't do that here. So have a, a think for a second, and then when you have, feel free, just to talk to the person next to you. What are the con what are the questions that you bring into the room around this? Uh, and I'll write a few of them up because that'll help me to frame and connect in as we do the the presentation more properly. Um, some of you might be very good at this. You might be a very direct and skillful person. Others of you will feel the other way. I'm pretty clear what I want to say, but I'm not good at coming forward and say it. Some of you may feel I'm very good at coming forward, but I'm not skillful in my language and I end up hurting people when I come forward. I do more damage than I to the relationship, even though I, I do say the thing that needs to be said. So whatever is the question for you, um, just have a think and then a quick chat with the person next to you. Okay, so just a flavor, if you could give me a couple of questions just to give us a sense because, you know, we're all separate minds, but then there's the room that we're all here together as well. What kinds of questions that people were, were, were beginning to ask? There are no good questions or bad questions, just our questions. We're just people figuring out complex things. Anybody want to? Yeah? In a difficult situation when it comes to someone who's maybe 
say wanting to quit or team selection or yep. uh, disciplinary action. Uh, so those three that come to mind straight away that I've had to deal with. Um, I, like, I don't know, I try and put myself in their shoes. Is that something that you would do and, and work, yep. work that way? Try and figure out how they felt in those situations and maybe rewind and uh, so they, reverse they, engineer why they did what they did. And, and, and yeah, how do you maintain empathy? How do you develop empathy in a, in a difficult situation? You're about to tell somebody that's something they've trained for, they haven't made the team, they haven't made the squad. Um, uh, but you know they're an, they're an athlete you're going to maintain a relationship with. Uh, they're important in the program, but they're not, they haven't made the squad. Um, and, and the suggestion is, do you, um, is it a strategy of, of, of worth to actually try and come out of your own space and almost sit in their chair for a moment and think, what would it be like to hear this? How would I like to hear this? Uh, because it's it's high stakes for you, because you care about them, and you're the coach, but it's high stakes for them because they have to hear it. Um, the, the, when I worked in New Zealand sport, I was doing a workshop on influence, and I asked them to name somebody that had the most influence. Uh, a very influential person because I wanted this person to give a do a segment of the influence workshop with me And they all named the same fellow not everybody but most people named this fe same fellow I said, what does he do and they said sort of precisely what you have just said sorry I don't know your name uh, Matt they said they said precisely what what Matt has just said they said they said he is the one who tells people that they're getting cut from programs he's the one who tells even physios that they're not going to the Olympics they might have been attached to you know, they're bringing a smaller number of physios. So he's the one who has those conversations uh, in, in, high, in high performance sport in New Zealand. And they said, however he does it, and even though you seldom like what he has to tell you, you always walk away from talking to that man feeling respected. You walk away thinking, I hate that he told me that, but I love the person who told me that because he did exactly Matt what you and when I talked to him I said how do you manage to do that how do you actually build relationship in a difficult conversation and he said exactly what you said he said you know what I actually do he said before they're coming in he says I actually sit in their seat literally physically just to change my mind shift because I'm going to be sitting in my chair um, but they're going to be sitting in their chair and he said just to trigger my empathy, I get up before they come in and I sit where they're going to be sitting and I just try and put myself in their place. What will it be like to be going home to tell your wife this, to tell your parents this? What is he going to have to say tonight? She going to have to go home with tonight? And he, he literally runs through as best he can. Now, that's not a perfect experience. Like you can't experience what somebody else is experiencing. But, but you can trigger your own empathy uh, in, ways, uh, in ways like that. His motto on his desk, as I'm talking to him, his motto, and we heard uh, Bang uh, talking about mottos today and the importance of motto. His motto is a quote, um, and it says, everyone is fighting a battle. that I know nothing about. Be kind. Always. So here's this person doing really difficult things whose motto is Remember that everyone is fighting a battle you know nothing about. When you're doing difficult things, be kind always. This is an insight into a person who's really, really good at this. You can be really direct and really caring. Can you get a sense of it? You can be really direct and really caring. Thanks for the question, Matt. Anybody else got a, a question or I just an opening up again? Sorry, what's your name? My name's Dan. Dan. Um, when I'm having difficult conversations, um, I think perhaps it's part of my personality, 
generally in life is I'm over concerned with what people think of me. Yeah. Um, and I think I carry that kind of that baggage with me into most of the conversations that I'll yeah. have. So Dan's comment again, very powerful, courageous comment that when I, when he's in the situation of having a different conversation, for his own life story reasons, he's concerned about how people feel about him and what people think about him. Uh, and he carries that baggage, that sort of concern into the conversation and it contaminates sometimes the space that we have to talk to the other person in. Is that a fair comment then? Yeah, or, or perhaps how direct I'll be. Or how direct uh, I'll yeah, be, yeah. Or, or yeah. Perhaps, um, to go dance around the subjects a little bit yeah. and maintain that. Yeah. Uh, maintain the relationship. So in, in, in many ways, this fighting back against the directness that we have to show in a professional <coughs> world. Uh, I'm, I'm similar, by the way, Dan. So like, that's not an unusual. I think many of us would have that experience that I, I want people to like me. I want, not, not just to like me, I just, I just want to be kind to people. I want people to think that I'm a decent person and so on. I, I am anxious about maintaining my reputation in the world as a decent human being, as a kind, as a caring person. And when I have to, in my professional life, step forward and say, that's not good enough, that really, that's, that's wearing, that's taxing, that's hard. And sometimes I pull my punches because I'd rather be liked than respected. I'll pay for it with respect, but I won't pay for it. I won't let, let the like bleed out of the relationship. I'll let some of the risk, you know, and it's often my own respect because I know I didn't say what I needed to say. It's my walking away from that room knowing I didn't say what needed to be said. So here's a technique, Dan, or a thought that, that I found, uh, and this is coming from top end coaches that have taught me this. When we face that dilemma with top-end coaches, sometimes somebody will say something so extraordinary, you'll think, oh my God, these guys work to a different plan to me. One of the coaches said to another coach who's similar to us, you need to change what you're loyal to. Because at the moment, you're loyal to the current state. As a coach, you must be loyal to the future state. Our jobs are to be loyal to people's potential. And it's actually more kind to talk straight now so that we get somewhere that we care about than it is to let people off the hook now. And it's been quite helpful to me, Dan, because I've actually reminded myself loyal to the future. Sometimes if I have to say things that are difficult, it's because I care about you that I'm saying those things. It's because I want to contribute to a future that you care about that I'm having this conversation. And I'll even say that now in conversation, Dan. I'll say, this is a hard conversation to me to have because as a person, I really like you. You know how much I care about you. But I'm not here as your friend. I'm here as your coach. And a coach's job is to talk about what's not here yet. Coach's job is to move the person from the now to the next, from the current state to the better state for them. And to be deeply kind to that person, we have to be prepared to talk about things that aren't here yet. And so it sort of helps me just to prepare myself in that space to just stay with that. Because it's not because I don't care about you, I'm having this conversation, it's because I do. But, and you can remind the other person that this might be tricky for us to talk about. Remember where it's coming from in me. This is probably hard for me to say, it's probably hard for you to hear. We need this courage because we care about what we're trying to do together. Any other just early thought? Yes? Yeah, it's quite similar to what you just said. So we, we are talking about making the questions uh, objective ones so that we want to address the situations and not attacking the person. That will come up in the presentation. It's a great question too. So observations are easier to talk about than inferences. So we never make judgment comments, lean in and say, you don't care. So if you say to somebody, you don't care about training, you're leaning into them, you're going beyond the behaviors you've seen and into deciding why they do it. So you're making a judgment comment, whereas you have been late for training for the last four sessions, or you've come without the right equipment. So, so now we can talk about that, because that's ob as objective as we can, it's clear, it's data, it's not judgment. 
So it's again, it's a really astute point, uh, and I will we'll practice a little bit of that as we go through in this session. You know, how do you make sure you keep your 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 comments to what's observable and seeable by you and them, and not going into what, why they're doing it. Don't go at their intention. Go at their impact. What's observable. So critical thoughts, guys. Like these are critical thoughts as we sort of go into this space. So we said three things: empathy, loyalty to the future, and observations, not judgments. In fact, you can all go home now. <laughs> if we could do any of that, if we could get those three things, think of the power of those three things. If we could get those into our practices, we would be very strong in this space. Empathy and kindness for the person. Loyalty though to their potential that isn't here yet. And skillful language that talks about observation that doesn't make judgment. So I like grids as I think I showed you one yesterday or at least the other session. So if we put candor, candor means directness, straightforwardness. Candor is just a word, it's a bit of a buzzword. I try and I were talking about it. There's a lot of talk in the literature at the moment about candor. It means directness, it means straight. And care is like, you know, what we know, care is personal. Uh, you know, concern, empathy, and so on. So if you, and sometimes we think that they're two ends of a spectrum, that they're the opposites of each other. You're either straight or you care. And this presentation is trying to say, no, 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 no. You can have candor and care. So imagine if um, a culture, a group, a team, was low care, low candor. So there wasn't much care in the group, and there wasn't much clarity, directness in the group. You know, you're going to get a quite a, a low performing group. You're going to get a really apathetic, um, lost group of people. You know, you'll still get a few good people trying to do stuff, but often they'll end up leaving. You know, and always under pressure, that group will fall apart. It's not clear about what it's trying to do, and it's got no care anyway. So we, but we're not going to worry about that. Hopefully none of us are, are going to be there. We, you know, we're not going to be there. I'll, you'll get the slides. You can also have really high candor, low care organization, really clear, really precise, really directive, telling everybody what they need to do, um, but not caring about the relationships enough. And what you'll often get in that is pretend feedback, damaging feedback, really direct feedback that damages relationships. And I won't read all these out. Essentially, the culture that will emerge is kind of compliance. I'll do it to told. You're the boss. You keep me on track. I'll do what I'm told. But, you know, that's, it's, it sort of might look okay from the outside, but it's a compliance culture. It's the army. It, it can be the army. In the old army, now that the army is becoming more asymmetric, the army is starting to understand that modern enemies don't fight by the old rules. Uh, modern enemies are asymmetric. They're, they're, you know, and so the army, in many ways, certainly the American army, are. We, we talk about uh, Stanley McChrystal when he went into um, Afghanistan. He went in with the best army in the world, and he said we were perfectly prepared to fight an enemy that didn't exist, because Al Qaeda wouldn't fight by the rules that they were trained to, and so he had to completely strip out a lot of his off his assumptions. Uh, but it is the army as we typically. Perceive it. The army is a structured environment as we typically perceive it. Authority is passed down, up uh, on really vertical lines. Everybody knows their roles. Everybody does what they're expected to do. And you know what? In certain circumstances, that's really important. Uh, but in the world that's becoming more disruptive, uh, more asymmetric, um, power is under pressure in the world at the moment. How power is conducted is under pressure in the world. There's a book out at the moment called The End of Power. Uh, because so much knowledge has been democratized, uh, you know, people want in in a different way to what they want. Young people don't want to nowadays live by a strict a hierarchy as older people like myself were able to accept when we were when we were young. The, the people in front of you in your coaching space will, will be coming from a different set of mental models, many of them, than the ones that you might have accepted. Uh, those of you who are, you know, um, you know, for, over forty, say. Um, so you can have high care, low candor. This is a little bit of a complacent organization where it's just about being nice, look after you, and if it's really tough, don't say it. You got a lot of complacency in that organization or that group. Uh, but you get real joy in a group 
where the care is high and the candor is high. When, when, when we know we're talking to each other straight because we care about each other and because the mission we've got together is an important one for us all. So that's the sort of sweet spot that we're trying to aim at. And, you know, without reading all that, um, this is sort of where we want to be. Uh, there are deficiencies that we want to avoid in these other places. Um, and in conversation, because it's so fluid, there are only a few things you can really, there's only a few fixed points in conversation that you can prepare for. Much of ha what happens is going to come from the other person, so you can't predict everything. Uh, Mike Tyson, the boxer, was once told, I wouldn't quote Mike Tyson very often, uh, but you remember the boxer Mike Tyson? Uh, he was once told that he was meeting a boxer who, who had a plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. Are you worried about this guy because he's got a plan for you, Mike? And Tyson said, everybody has a plan until he gets a punch in the mouth. <laughs> and, and then the plan goes out the window. Uh, and in, in difficult conversations, that you know, in difficult conversations, you know, you can be as planful as you like, but what the other person says, how people feel, the energy, you know, the, the emotions in the room, you know, the plan will never be exactly how it goes. But you have some leverage around preparation, around what you say first. You can plan your opening statement. You can plan how you're going to step start. Um, you can plan when a conversation goes off track, you can have a statement ready to, to put the conversation back on track. You can plan how you finish, and obviously you can plan afterwards. You can plan, you can think about how to reflect them. So there's a little bit of, of structure that you can plan for. But inside, in the gaps between all these then, is the, is the really messy bit of a difficult conversation when the emotions get going. Um, conversation, like human beings aren't, we're rational. But our rational brain is sort of the last bit of our brain to evolve. So our, our executive brain, our prefrontals, you know, that's the reptilian brain got going first. The limbic sort of emotional brain built up around that. And then the executive function, sort of the rational part of us. Uh, so if you like, the, the rational brain is like a, a mahout. You know, the, the guy who sits up on the elephant and directs the elephant. Um, but the elephant is the, is the emotion. And as long as the elephant is happy, the mahout's fine, beautiful. But as soon as the emotion gets into a conversation, the you know, mahout just needs to hang on because the elephant is deciding what, what happens in that room. And so emotion is the bit that makes this uh, start to get really sort of messy and flexible emotion, how we're feeling. Look at the other part of the weaning away. Oh, and that's, in the, that's implied in the prepared yeah, yeah. So how you prepare, when are you going to have this conversation? Even if you're going to have this conversation, where should you have it? Like, uh, do you want any barriers between you and the other person? If it's, you know, or you want to just sit in a more relaxed space with them and so on. Is it a coffee shop? Just to uh, just change the, the formalities of it. Sometimes it's not. It's your desk you want. Because you want to maintain, you know, you want to maintain a barrier between you and the other person and, and, and show that this is a, an authority conversation. So all of that, Divya. Um, so we've got a little bit of flexibility, uh, a little bit of preparation there, but we've got to be really fluid then inside the space after that. And Jim Knight, who does research on conversational intelligence, he said that the stance, the sort of internal space that we need to be in to have these conversations, and I've adapted it, I've added some, uh, it, you know, Ten Commandments there. This is sort of who needs, what you need to be like, that, that conversation, that people are equal. Even if I'm di delivering a difficult message, this other person is, the, is as legitimate as me. Um, I want again read them all out. That, that you're not being attacked here. You know, there's the, just to lessen the stakes a bit. Take the stakes down. Nobody dies here. I'm not trying to land a, an A380. You know, if you make a mistake, it's not a catastrophe. Just lower the stakes a bit. Uh, and you know. If you're in a difficult conversation with somebody, it's probably that your stories are different from theirs. Let's clarify that. And it's good that you think, and we can get better because of this. Things can get better between us. Um, so that's the sort of internal space that skillful people. And when I talk to my friend who, who says this, who has this on his desk, when I talk to him, uh, he wouldn't use the same language, but, but you'll hear that in how he approaches these. This is where he's coming from. This is what maintains his, uh, his respect for the other person and their respect for him. 
But of course, we don't see ourselves clearly. We all think we're, we're, we're one thing, and, and, you know, we don't see ourselves clearly. You know, our, 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 our um, fundamental attribution error is that we think people can see what we mean. We think people can see what we intend. But that's not what people see. People hear our words and people experience our impact. So, you know, I think you know I'm a nice person when I'm in this conversation. I think you know I care about you. Of course you know I wouldn't be trying to hurt you. They don't see that. Unless they can hear it, or they can experience it. Um, and so, you know, all of us are, are less clear. They, uh, um, Lindley's research is that fewer than one in three of us are, are clear on what we're good at. Less than one in three people are clear about what they're good at, uh, let alone what we're not good at. Uh, which is really why feedback is so important from the outset. Because when you get feedback from somebody who's skillful, they're giving you a sense of what you're experienced as. If you don't get feedback from others, if your feedback all comes from yourself, we wander around, it's all going beautifully in here. How good is this? And we have all stories that trigger all our, our we, we're, we're, we're a story that's the next person. There are, way back even in our childhood, there are stories that are still playing out in our adulthood. You know, I, I'm working with somebody at the moment and his old story is, uh, I always have to prove myself. So from his family, we heard uh, in the keynote this morning, the power of the family uh, for good. In his family, you know, he, he had a good family, but his dad made him feel that he always had to prove himself. And so he goes into every sort of difficult conversation, sort of with a kind of a competitive edge, with a, with a willingness to think that old story gets triggered very quickly. Prove yourself, prove yourself, prove yourself. We, we've all got old stories. Like the five-year-old, the man grows around the boy. The woman grows around the girl. Like we don't leave our five and our ten-year-olds behind. Those sort of old stories stay in us for a long time. And of course, we all have different social styles. I don't know in the room, I'll give you a chance to have a buzz about this. I don't know if you've used read social styles. There are lots of ways of doing this. This is not meant to be the best or only way. But broadly speaking, it's easy to see that they say people come from, broadly speaking, we come from one of these four social styles, all of us. Um, some of us are very analytical. We want it to be right. We really want things to be analyzed well, to be right, to be factual, to be clear. Uh, that's our driving motivation. Uh, and when you're working with an analytical person, you know, you, you, you kind of have to sort of work well with the grain of them. Like the, the grain of that person needs us to be respectful of their stance in the world. Other people are really driving styles. Their, their drive is to get results. Can we get this done? Clear, let's get this sorted out. Move, let's go. Driving styles. And, and when you're working with them, there's sort of another, there's another way of working that's slightly different. Uh, some people are amiables, but their real, their real need uh, is to make sure everyone's okay. Including themselves. Can we all be safe here? They'll often be the peacemakers in a group, you know, and they'll often be the ones who are coming at that space. Um, and if you're working with an expressive, they really want everybody to know that they're bad. They're really about value. Do you know how good I am? I know how good, like, they're into that space of, please don't think I don't know this. They're in that sort of value, the value space. This is the sort of, this is the challenge for each of these, organ these groups. The driving person often doesn't listen enough because they want to get on to the result. The driving person's trap is not to listen sometimes. It's a fast. The analytical person sometimes can never have enough analysis. Their stance, their, their problem can be just to, just to declare, to make a stand. Because they'd like to get more data, they'd like to think about it a bit more. The amiable person, because they're trying all the time to make sure it's safe for everyone, to just take a stance to move forward and have a going because they're wondering, oh my God, I hope that doesn't affect anybody. Is everybody going to be okay with this? And so they tend to be slower to initiate. And the expressive person who's, who's really about competence and value, and these are all powerful styles, by the way. Nothing's wrong with any of these styles, but knowing where you are is important. They often uh, are so, un so expressive about what they know that they don't check what other people know. 
And can you apply these to organizations as well? Well, I work with them in business, uh, and so I do work with them in business, yeah. Um, you could even, and I, I don't know the research around this, so, but I, I think you could even characterize organizations as a collective sometimes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, that you might see a whole group that you say, actually, this is the social value, this is what's awarded in this organization. Um, you could possibly even apply it to cultures, but I, 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 that's a... As a, a practical application rather than a researched answer. Um, yeah, I mean, you'll often find leaders sort of in that space. Um, these are kind of, uh, so these are sort of uh, public styles. These people are not afraid to talk. These are more private styles. These people tend to be more reflective, withdrawn. Um, these are more effective styles, and those are more power styles. So there's, 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 there's a lot of subtlety. If you look up social styles, I mean, you can get a little bit more stuff. But you, you use Myers-Briggs, you use other things, I'm sure, to sort of um, make similar distinctions, but for the sake of, of this. So if you're having a difficult conversation with somebody and you know that they're highly analytical in their approach, it, it's, it's quite important that, that you frame what you have to say in a way that they can hear it properly. If you're having a difficult conversation with a highly driving style, like, you know, some of us are in the middle here, we can, we can operate a different, whether you know a strongly driving style, you know, you, your data would want to be talking about how, why this makes a difference and how quickly we can get, you know, you have to convince them. Um, if you're having a, a, a difficult conversation with these guys, you know, you have to prepare your conversation. The other person is in the room with you too. And so some sort of sense of who they are is quite helpful. Just have a quick, Break, guys, just have a quick chat. That's a lot coming from the front before we get into the into some more practical things here. But just have a, a chat just to get the sort of sound of my voice out of your head for a second and um, tell each other what you're thinking. Or just just think if you want. It can be a bit contextual too. Sometimes the task you're doing can put you into a space. The expectation of the task can say you need to be a driver on this one because you're leading this. And if it's not your natural style, sometimes that's why your leadership work can feel. I don't really like it. It's not that flash in this. But it's like left handed and right handed. You probably have a slight default style. If I under pressure or I might default in one of the four styles more than the other. Okay. Anybody want to anybody need it need to say anything or want to say anything or are we comfortable just to move on into like the key principles I think are starting to emerge. I'm really emerging from you, not from me. The key principles are around empathy and around... Um, and then for a bit of fun, you know in the literature there are 10 different difficult kinds of people you have to deal with from time to time. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we're probably that ourselves sometimes. So the tank is the person who just rolls over the top of you. So you're in a conversation, you know, like a tank, literally they roll over the top of you. So you're starting to have a conversation, you're, there she goes. 
The sniper just drops in a little quiet, little, you know, from 100 meters, you just got you. And it's the next day and you're still worried about it. The next day you're still worried. And it actually almost gets worse the longer it be, because they've just got a little comedy in that really kills you. The know-it-all is generally somebody who does know a lot. And they outflank you all the time with knowledge. Oh, ha haven't you read that? Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. I would have assumed you read that. <laughs> I didn't even get breakfast this morning. No, you don't ask me what I've read. They, I think I know it all as a different person. Uh, they can only talk general, really. And once you probe, you find out, hold on a second, you don't know what this actually looks like on the ground. You've got this beautiful, um, sounds very impressive, starting a conversation. I get, you get away with it because people think, oh my God, that's very powerful. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, you don't know how to talk. You can, you can talk, you can't walk this. So that's a different person. And we're all annoyed and deal with these different kinds of people. So, uh, the grenade. That's the person, if you do the wrong thing, it blows up on you. If you pull the pin out of this person, if you say the wrong thing, it might be 10 second delay, but it's going to blow up, right? <laughs> uh, we know them as well. Um, and they're sort of obvious styles. These ones are actually quite difficult too, to deal with. You know, the yes person, the person just agrees with everything. Can you please disagree with me? Like, give me something to work with here. And you know, if you're having a difficult conversation with the other person and you're trying to say something important, they're saying, yes. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, great. Chief Brennan, I'm really glad you told me, yeah, 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 can I leave now? Right? So they don't give you anything. Um, the maybe person, you know, they've never seen a fence they didn't want to sit on. You know, the fence sitters, they, they'll, you know, they just sit on the fence. They don't go one way or the other. So you don't know what to, how to work with them. The no person is, you know, they're against everybody. The whiner, they're only happy when they're unhappy. So that's the person, you know, in an organization who's always complaining. And if you solve things, it doesn't matter because they'll have another thing behind them. If you solve it, there'll be another thing. If you solve it, another thing. And that can be really annoying. Uh, and then the nothing person is like a black hole in physics, you know. It doesn't matter what energy goes into it, nothing comes back out. And they often wear you down in leadership because you keep trying to reach them and they keep saying, come again, mate, come again, come again, give me more, right? So they're, they're that person. And you know, many of you would have good strategies for some of that, but there'll be one or two of those types that you find probably particularly tricky to deal with. Um, I don't know, you know, again, which ones you find tricky to deal with. Um, I suppose the self-reflective question would be, which one do you become yourself when you're not at your best? Which one do we become ourselves when we're not at our best? You know, under pressure, our, 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 um, you know, our behavior sometimes breaks down under pressure. We become the thing that we're um, not that proud of. So anyway, there's just a little bit of thought there. And you'll all, as you listen to that, usually you're putting names in. Putting in people's names, you're putting in, oh, that's what she's like, that's what he's like. Um, if you ever write names on this, don't leave it on a photocopier. Because <laughs> it would be a lethal weapon in the wrong hands. Uh, talk about a grenade, um, that would be a lethal weapon. But, you know, we all deal with, we deal with tricky, uh, tricky people all the time. And, uh, but they're still people. And they're still fighting battles that we know nothing about. And it doesn't. The fact that they're a tank doesn't allow us to say, it doesn't really matter, I could be unkind to her. Because then we're lower, then we lessen ourselves. Then the behavior is a race to the bottom. When in fact leadership is trying to rise the tide, the rising tide lifting all the boats, trying to create the best environment as, as again we heard in the keynote this morning, creating the best environment for the best behavior so that the people can flourish. So we don't fight on their terms, we fight on the terms of our values and our ethics and our and our deeper hopes. There's always a choice. This is Viktor Frankl. Uh, again, many of you have known and have read books. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist who was imprisoned in the, by the Germans during the war. Um, and they took everything from him. You know, his titles, his name, his, his family. He was in a hard labor camp, not an extermination camp, so a hard labor camp. And uh, he began to look at the people in the camp that were working with him, and he, begin, he began to realize over time that he almost knew who would die next from the hard labor. 
he would watch people going out into these work details in the morning and he had a fair idea who wouldn't make it back in that day. And he attributed that in the end to um, meaning. The, the people who, like he remembers, he talks about a guy who, who had cigarette butts that he picked up off the ground that the guards had thrown away. And a little bit of tobacco left. He had three of these little cigarette butts. And essentially his life meaning had come back down to the fact that he had these three cigarette butts. That's all he had left to live for. And he, Frankel, in, in some interview says, I remember the day he smoked them before he went out, knowing he would have no reason to put up with the hardships of the day. He's at the end of his tether. He smoked the meaning that he had left, and he would probably not make it through the day. Uh, he, and he survived the camp, Frankel, and wrote a book and founded a school of therapy called Logotherapy, Meaning Therapy, uh, and said that this is kind of the last thing we can do without his meaning. At the end of it all, we still have to have meaning. Um, the other really powerful thing that Frankel talks about is choice. One day when he was being beaten by a guard, a guard of 19 or 20 years of age, beating this psychiatrist in a, in a chair, he looked at the guard and he had an inspiration, he had a moment of inspiration where he thought, I'm freer than you. I'm the one in the chair getting beaten. You're the one with the power and the truncheon but I'm actually freer than you. And what he said really powerfully was that between anything that happens to you and your response, there's a little space. Between anything that happens to you and your response is a space. And how you use that space, how you use that space is the place that makes you either great or not so great. It's the place that, it's the last of the human freedoms. So if anybody's angry with you, between that and your response, there's a space. And you can anger up again, back, get all Irish. Right? Or you can actually say, no, no, he's angry. I can respond in lots of ways to that. Um, and people who are really skillful at difficult conversations, they don't let the space get shut down easily. They have comments, they have ways of keeping the space open so that the room has room for everybody to breathe in, not like a telephone box or something. Stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power, often the last of our powers, to choose our response. And in our response lies your growth and freedom that we're given along. So we've asked you already to think about are you more hint and hope in conversation? Or are you more say and slay? So some people are say and slay, I just say it directly. Yeah, but everybody's dying. You're not skillful. So that's say and slay. Hint and hope is. Just put the vibe out there, hope everybody picks it up. Talk to the whole team when you really only want to be talking to one person. That's hint and hope. Uh, and, and, and skillful people are kind of saying things with respect. They're sort of in between. They're saying direct things, but they're saying them with respect. And that's the sort of sweet spot we're trying to aim for. Um, there are conversations you have to have in leadership. Uh, this is the Australian Army. There are conversations you can't avoid. If you avoid conversations, people will think your leadership is not strong in that space. Um, standards you walk past, people are watching that. If important things are being walked past, people are making assumptions about your leadership. Uh, not suggesting you should fight all the time, you know, but it, you have to be ready to go when you have to go. So you had that question on the sheet last yesterday, on the keynote yesterday, one of the questions coaches ask me a lot, how do you deal with high performing bad citizens? So you can't criticize their play, but their colleagueship, their teamship, their, their cultureship, their citizenship, horrendous. And we, uh, we made another grid. <laughs> <laughs> Performance, citizenship. You know, don't worry about the, you know what I mean by citizenship, commitment to the team beyond the play. And so we got four categories again. And again, you don't want to leave this one on the photocopier if you put people's names on it. Because you do get these high-performing bad citizens. And I want to show you how they deal with that in conversation. They deal with that by acknowledging the performance first and challenging the citizenship. I'll show you the form of words they use. Then you get some really strong people in your culture. They're really good performers and they're really good for others. They mentor, they support. You know, this guy could be a bully, this person could be a bully in the culture, but a great player. And they're really difficult to deal with because the sponsors love them because they only see the player. 
the sports body might love them because they only see the player. The player is good for the profile of the sport. But the team is dying around them because they're bullying younger players or they're, they're you know, doing inappropriate things, whatever. So you get high-performing bad citizens. You get high-performing good citizens. By the way, stay out of their way. They're better than you. <laughs> Leaders, they don't need heavy leadership. They need light-touch leadership. If you want to enlist them as mentors, they're powerful mentors to the rest of the players and so on because, because they can talk performance and they can talk citizenship. They can't be outflanked by one of these two things. So they make strong mentors and, and light-touch leadership is probably all they need. They're already strong. Then you get this nagging group, the low-performing good citizen. They won't train properly, they won't pay attention to standards properly, but they're beautiful. They remember everybody's birthdays. <laughs> they don't mean they're, 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 when somebody's in strife, they're in with them. They're, you know, talk about high care. When somebody's having a tough time, they're sitting with them. So they're really, really, often really loved. They don't want to train anymore. They don't want to pay attention to standards anymore. And then you get this sad category. The question the coaches ask me, how did they get into the program? <laughs> <laughs> Who let them in? I reckon that it's a case of the three, the two on the top and one on the right, they all get the team until they get down to the National Elite team. And there are thresholds in here. Yeah. Because you can have somebody who was a great player who over time, as they get older perhaps or whatever, they drop off slightly, but they're still a great citizen and you'll hold them, you'll hold them for a while because they're really good for the group. But then let's say you had a whole generation of them aging together and you're holding them for a while, you know, this is the, you know, well, who am I telling guys, right? You're in this space. But then, so the question started to become, where are the thresholds? Because these are not just four categories, these are sort of tolerances. That's a performance conversation. That person needs to leave the team because they're killing the culture and they're not delivering anything. There is no reason like other than weakness. If somebody's really down here, now you, you know, somebody can drop a little bit on citizenship. We live with that for a while and we have conversations. In fact, exactly as you said, Dave, this is where the conversation starts. When it gets to a place that, you know, we can't drop any more on this. This is some issues that we need to we need to address. And the same with performance. You know, performance can drop back. And for a while, that's okay. We let it, but there's a time, there's a threshold. Where, no, no, we need to have a conversation now. This is where these message delivery conversations, we have to be prepared to go there when, we thresh, when the thresholds are reached. So I asked the coaches to put in their words how they would start a conversation with her and how they would start a conversation with her or him. And here's what the coaches came up with. They said, you try to bend the strength back on itself. If they're strong on performance, bend that back on culture. So they, I really admire the commitment you give to getting everything out of yourself in training. You leave nothing to chance. You're actually an example in this group of commitment and discipline and excellence in your training. What I want to talk to you about, though, is how to use that same commitment example. See the skill getting bent back on itself? How do you use that in leading within this culture more broadly? Because that's where your journey is. That's where your growth and commitment lies. This the, sorry, now, you, 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 we'd all put this in our own language. That was what they came up with. This is maybe six coaches working in a workshop with me. I really admire your high performance. I want you to apply the same talent to your cultural performance. Here's the low-performing good citizen. Same methodology, obviously different words. You've got to acknowledge the citizen and bend it into the performance space. You have been loyal to this place and to this group for a long time. Uh, you hold the story of the place together. People revere you here. Uh, people look up to you. I want you to focus your loyalty on your performance tonight now because that's where your journey lies. If you do that flexing right, I think you can say difficult things, direct things, while acknowledging that the person, without doing anything to disrespect the person. You're actually even giving them hope if you do it well, because you're telling them the talents that you use in performance, the same talents will be helpful in culture. Commitment, dedication to 
culture now. Loyalty, care, loyalty to performance now. So you're actually almost telling them the pathway, you're starting a conversation about how they can do what you want them to do. Of course, this is all predicated on one thing, and that is that we have performance standards that we can talk about, and that we have cultural standards, citizenship standards that we can talk about. In sports, I find often we have really clear performance standards. We can have the performance conversation pretty clear. And I mean behavioral standards, things that people can say, not just the values, behaviors, uh, data, like really discussable, observable things. I, I, I sometimes find that all we have over here are our values. We don't have clear citizenship behaviors that we expect of each other. For example, that everyone picks up their fair share of the workload here. That, uh, that it's a privilege to wear the shirt. And part of that privilege means senior players mentoring younger players and making sure that they're brought into the space well. You know, whatever those standards are. So explicit standards in the cultural space. Not a big labor issue of body standards. Four, three, four, five key behaviors. Uh, because that becomes the data that you'll be able to talk about when you're having a different conversation. Because it's behavioral standards we're talking about. And I can tell you, you haven't been at training uh, on time for the last four, for four of the last five sessions. And it's a standard here that uh, when everyone is, when anyone's late, it's a disrespect to the group. Because the others have made the effort to be there on time. They're waiting for you. When anyone's late, it's a disrespect to the group. There'll be circumstances, of course, fine. But if there's a pattern, because we don't go for a difficult conversation the first time something happens, unless it's a really bad breach. We go for a difficult conversation when there's a pattern in what people are doing. Because you've got enough data to go in with then. If anybody can make a mistake, I'm talking about the pattern now. So uh, I find it quite useful. Even as a, you know what a, a concept does? It actually gives you a frame. It gives you explanatory power. It gives you a way of thinking about it. You know that. You know the people here. You know, if, if we had the whiteboard there in your team, you could tell us where people are. And you could say, oh, he, you know, he's, he's, he's just coming back slightly. She's just coming forward slightly. You could position most of the people there with reasonable accuracy. Um, one coach I know has done this activity with the team, and they got the assistant coaches and themselves to position people. And they had a conversation about why do we see them differently? Are we seeing anybody differently that, you know, who you see as, as high culture, I'm seeing as slightly as lower culture? What do you see that? And even that was clarifying for the, for the coach. But don't leave it around if you do put anything uh, that I can name on. And they, these kind of phrases are quite useful in this space. And we've talked about uh, the courage to stay loyal to the future of a student, of a person that, you, that is your like an athlete that is your student. So the fundamentals. The other thing, you have leverage over how you prepare yourself. So when I was a school principal, a little bit, you might not know this. Some of you are in schools, I'm sure you know this well. It's kind of your job to get abused. Now and again, people will abuse you. They'll blame you for things that aren't your fault. Sometimes the staff will blame you for decisions you made. Sometimes the parents will blame you because every child is a genius. Um, if there's anything goes wrong, it has to be the school's fault. Um, and and I, I, I've been in some pretty tough conversations with people. Um, and in some angry rooms, you know, where people are essentially um, insulting me. One woman one particular day, the word she chose to use for me for that day was stupid. You're stupid. Um, and, and sometimes you'll say, no, that's enough now. We won't have a conversation. And we can't be respectful. But I, I, I heard stupid a few times before I, uh, and I, I, she's called me stupid. She said, I was so stupid. I didn't care about the kids. I was so stupid. All I wanted to do was defend the staff. Uh, I got so good at this not taking it personal. But I'm in that room, and what's in my head is, lady, 
you got no idea how stupid I really am. <laughs> I'm far stupider than this. This isn't even the stupidest thing I've done today. Like, I'm not buying into her insult. And that's not just to be dis... I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to her. I need the space to deal with this well. And if I get sucked into the insult, if I give the insult permission to annoy me, then the space in the room to resolve the thing uh, it just isn't there. So, so... Because I can come out really tough. And I can tell her all sorts of things about, you know, and what happens then? I win, and the relationship loses. She wins, and the relationship loses. And we have to work on with each other. So we've got to maintain space. Nothing is, 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 uh, is personal, unless you, let, unless you let it. Like, there is an opportunity there between stimulus and response. You're stupid, and my response between that, there's a space. There's freedom. You don't know me well enough to say that. And it's really important that, and this is in the literature around Patterson and Grenny and others who've written around difficult conversations, when they study people who are great at difficult conversations, these are people who manage to maintain the campfire, who set up mutuality, mutual purpose and mutual respect in a conversation, and all the way through it, maintain that mutuality. So if I had three chairs, I'd show you, you know, in a, in a, in a conversation set up when it's going poorly, it can often feel like that. It's almost win-lose set up like that. Me and her fighting with each other. When you have a campfire, when you have mutuality, like we're both here to talk about your daughter, Jessica. We won't agree what's right for Jessica, but please understand that we both care. I know you care as her mother. This is the conversation with that woman calling me stupid. I know you care as her mother. You need to know that I care as her principal. But we don't agree on what to do for her, but we agree that we care for her. And if we can't agree on that, we shouldn't be in this room together. If you don't think that I'm here with the best intention for your daughter, there's no point in you even being in this school. And so setting up mutual purpose and mutual respect are fundamental. The first time somebody comes in for the difficult conversation, set the campfire. So. Uh, Troy has come in to talk about he's, he's, a, he's a great guy, but he's dropped off on his standards. Uh, oh no, let's just talk about working colleagues. We're working colleagues, but we're not getting on with each other this year. You're letting me down, I'm letting you down. We're not getting on with each other this year. But we've been strong in the past, right? And I need to talk to Troy. I have a supervisory role. I need to sit down and talk to Troy about that. Uh, what am I going to say? I'm going to say at the start of the conversation, to try and get the campfire burning, I'm going to say, man, we have been so strong in the past. The things I've learned from you and the work we've done together has been power in our relationship. It's been power in what we've done together. And I, and, and I consider you a person that I've learned from and that I've valued. But we're not learning and valuing from each other anymore. And I want to get back there. I want to be back where we've been with each other. So you were loyal to our future. I'm flagging that we have a future. Uh, and I need to talk about that now. The powerful thing to do is to set a campfire, to set mutuality in the conversation. And, and you know, it's every conversation has a campfire. There's a me and a me. You have to create the we. Otherwise, it's, it, it'll be a win-lose. Uh, you know, somebody will get powerful, somebody will get disrespectful, and somebody will use authority. Somebody will lose. Get a campfire going. Early in the conversation. Remember, uh, it's really, this is awkward for us. Probably you're not. We don't want to have this conversation, but remember what we're trying to do here. Remember why we need this courage. We care about the program. We just have different stories at the moment, and we need to, we need to have the courage to talk about them because we care about the program. Campfire. Um, so there's kind of statements, you know, and again, you'll get this in the slides, guys, if you, because language is important. You know, campfire, say, we're, we're here because we're passionate about it. You know, and, and this will probably be a passionate conversation, but remember it's passionate because we're passionate about our sport. Uh, let the passion roll. You know, we disagree. We disagree because we care so much about our sport. Or these kids that we're training with. I won't go through them all. Um, look at that one. 
uh, things are not going well for us. And at, and at the moment, we need to have a truthful, really courageous conversation. We need to do that now. Um, so let's make sure we stay connected. The statements like that early in a conversation. Because once you have a campfire, when the conversation starts to go wrong, you know what you can do? You can put your hand out over the campfire and say, can we just stop for a second? I think we're losing purpose or respect. You've got a, ref a reference place to go back to if the conversation starts to go wrong. You can make an intervention statement and say, hey, Brendan, just time out here for a second. We're getting angry. And I think we're forgetting the thing we care about together. Don't be afraid to name emotion. That's the elephant, remember? It's like the Mahout talking to another Mahout trying to pretend they're not on both, both of them on elephants. Don't be afraid to name emotion when the conversation starts to lose its focus. So I'm going to just talk through um, a bit of a process for a message delivery. So not every conversation is a message delivery. Sometimes it's just a conversation to figure out what somebody else is thinking. But I, I'm, I'm picking a particular type of conversation where you have to take a leadership stance. You have to come forward and say something that the other person might not welcome. So message delivery. Okay? That's the, not all conversations. This conversation. So your initial stance, your energy has got to be advocates. It has to be coming forward. You can't just ask questions in a message delivery conversation. How's your life going? How are you feeling at the moment? See, that, that's, you're not delivering a message there. You're just giving, you know, <coughs> message delivery is, here's what I see. And in a, generally speaking, in a message delivery conversation, there'll be phases in the conversation. The first phase, because you're the leader of it, is raising the other person's awareness of the message. What, what, what do you see that they need to be aware of? Raising their awareness of what you see. So you got it's a data phase. It's, it's a telling them what you're thinking. The second phase is you coming down. So front foot phase first, awareness. Then coming back to listen to what they see. And you're particularly listening for acceptance, for some sort of sense that they've heard what needs to be heard. Because it's acceptance that drives us into the third phase, action. That's the broad phasing of this. I'll open this up a bit more. After the action, if they do deliver on the action that you've agreed, there's always an acknowledgement phase. As soon as you can, once you see that they're actually taking it on board, go and assure them that you really appreciate that they've actually taken the action you've asked. So don't wait too long to acknowledge if you can. That's the broad phases. We don't want to be inferring intent. You've already said that. We don't want to be, and we want to be using observations better more than judgments in our data. Um, so you know, if in your head there was a story, she's very lazy. You want to get that story out of your data because everybody's going to defend that. But maybe you'd start telling yourself a different story. It's kind of hard to see what she's capable of because she starts with an initial effort, but she doesn't give herself the challenge of the second effort. And you might have examples in training where initial effort, initial effort, initial effort, but no second effort. So you want to change your story. If you're in that space of telling a story about somebody, like they're disrespectful, he can't be bothered listening to anybody else. He's a know-it-all. He can't be bothered listening to anybody else. Uh, you want to start turning that into how are you becoming convinced? What is the data? He's got a habit of jumping into quickly. Uh, he's really keen to put his ideas across, but he never leans into anybody else's ideas. It's his idea, you know. So starting to change your, your story so you get the data clearer in your head. Uh, and uh, so we don't, because if you go in with that judgment comment, you'll create threat for the other person. You judge someone, they'll create threat. They'll, and they'll go into fight, flight, freeze. You know, the adrenaline will kick in, and they'll generally go into fight, flight, freeze. You know, they'll come out swinging, or they'll just want to be out of the room, or they'll just freeze up and you get nothing at all from them. So we don't want to do that to people. But we do want, we don't want them to be comfortable either in these situations. We need to be in, them to be in a challenge state. Uh, in, in leadership terms, you know, your leadership should provoke, if you looked at uh, leadership as, as, a, as, a, as a face of a dial or something, uh, some cultures and some leadership is too comfortable. Leadership is just nice. But other leadership is too threatening. Nobody's good enough. No matter how hard you work, I'll always find more for you to do. And so if you put your leadership energy into comfort, your group won't learn. It's just happy talk. But if you tip too far, you get your leadership into threat where nobody actually feels good enough. The place is just dying with threat. And there's no learning in threat. In threat, you're like a whiteboard. Your mind is like a whiteboard, you're surviving. 
Uh, and so leadership energy is always trying to find challenge. And uh, the zone of proximal development in, in education, Vygotsky, like that. The thing we can do next that's within our reach, that's hard to do, but it's within our reach. So we're always trying to find language in these situations that's direct and challenging, but we don't want to threaten. And we don't want to not say anything. So it's just a sort of framing of our language. Uh, I left the extra bars there because sometimes in a long form, of this, we do this over a day, people write scripts and stories. Uh, so we're always looking at what's observable. And then these three A's, there's awareness, there's acceptance, and there's action and acknowledge. They're the four A's that I talked about earlier on. First stage is for you to be clear on, when I've left this room, what must I have said? What is the critical message that I must say here? It's amazing how many people don't go in, they either win with too much to say, or not enough clarity around what must be said. So you've got to clarify the message for yourself before the conversation. And then you've got to collect some accurate data and examples. What are the observables that convince me? What would I be able to show them to convince them? You've got to have some observables. You're not just going in saying, I don't think you care. You're going in saying, the story I'm telling myself at the moment is based on the fact that you're late for training, that you're da, 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 and clear observable things. When you start the conversation, don't give all your data in your first, you know, you don't just go in and say everything. You go in with a couple of pieces of clear examples that you want to talk about. And you keep some data back. Because if they push back on you, if you don't get acceptance, you want to have other examples. So sort of split your data up. Uh, you know what I mean by data? Just examples, stories, clear things. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a hard one. If you're going to use data from somebody else, as far as possible, put their name on it. Because telling people that a number of people have been to see you to say this tends to provoke threat. So let's say teammates have come in to tell you, the coach, about another teammate who's, you know, whatever the standard is that they're breaking, clear standard. Very tricky situation, though. Because the moment you say that to them, a number of your teammates, you, you know what they're going to do. What we would all do, they'll spend most of the meeting trying to work out who's been in to see you. And, and trust is going to be damaged inside that group. So this is a sort of a, there's a bleed started there. There's a wound there now. That's a hard one for leaders often, because sometimes people come to you and say, I don't want you to take, I don't want you to use this data. Um, the, the damage that that does is, is, is this. Uh, so person A comes to the coach. Who's person B? Oh, no, let's put the coach as person C. It's nice for your C <laughs> coach. Person A comes to the coach to talk about person B. And says, and the coach then, with sort of that data, has to go and have a conversation if they decide to with person B. What that's called is a triangle, obviously. A triangle is a strong uh, geometric shape, but it's a weak conversational shape. Because, because the fact that person A has been to the coach is going to have an effect on person B. And in the strongest cultures I work in, one of the rules is no triangles. We're always aiming for no triangles. We're, so we're always trying to say to the people, uh, can you find a way of saying that to hurt yourself? Clear accountability on that diagram yesterday. Or I'll come with you if you want to have that conversation with them. Because a triangle doesn't mean not three people. It means that, that the person who's, who's, feed, who's getting the feedback is getting it from the person who did the observation. Yeah. If the secondary source delta couple falls, uh, and you don't have the opportunity to verify it, yeah. so how do you present this data to the, to the... If you don't have the opportunity to verify data, so it's not primary data, you haven't seen it, it's not clear data for you, uh, mm -hmm. it's dangerous. And so the person who gave me the data, I would be seeking verification from the person who gave me the data. And the best thing I'd be saying to them is, will you come and say this to them with me? Or will you go and see them yourself and talk to them? In a mature place, um, if we're having a difficulty, we'll be talking. We won't be transacting it through another person. 
Um, it, it just becomes, it's almost a denial of natural justice, but it's also trust damaging. If we know that, because the other thing it, it leads to is that people who have access to leadership then have enormous power. Because they can go above you and say things, and if you don't have the same access, you've got no control over the story about you that the other person is getting. And so in broad terms, we're trying to cut down triangles in organizations. So remember this cycling example I gave yesterday of the young person coming off the track, going to the data analyst, what's she doing as she hits the corner? Did I give that example in the keynote? Uh, now, she, that's a, that could have been a triangle because you've gone to the sports scientist to check the data. The sports scientist then could have gone to the coach and the coach could have gone to the lead athlete. But they didn't, they went together. It's okay to go and check. It's okay to verify. But she went with her. She went with them in the end. And so there's a real robustness to what they did. I've got another question there. Um, you make the assumption that most of the things about conversations um, and, and, and talking about organisation. But a lot of times in Singapore, there's a bigger group called the community of the sport. Yep. And, and when I say the bigger group, it's not actually that big. It's quite a small group. So there's situations where Let's say social media, people have their opinions how the team's playing and it comes through. Yeah. That, and you make the assumption that you'll still be able to have a conversation with people make comments about your coaching and that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? There's a it's easy enough to do in the organisation and within the team. So the outside body, uh, the media is reflecting, is commenting in on your performance? No, not the media, no, no. people in the community. So actual for other coaches or, or other people. Uh, directly involved even inside your people. national sports or association community yes, yes, yes yeah so yes. people outside your direct team yeah, yeah. So but inside your coaching players yeah. who are within the team as well so they've obviously yeah. negative towards the coach then they yeah. obviously influencing the players <laughs> they also coach right? yeah That's it. so it's what's the question hard, if it's a whole harder conversation necessary do we always have to have that conversation yeah, I mean, uh, you know, so just what the advice is saying, well, stay, just don't worry about it, just see more. Yeah, so, so the only time you would have a difficult conversation okay. is if you needed to. Yeah. Like, if, if, if things could get better because you had it, you'd have it. you'd have it. But if you're getting feedback and chatter from bodies outside who don't know the truth of the team, um, that's that sort of, um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And you say, you know what? That's uninformed chatter. It's noise. It's not going to affect us unless we let it affect us. So it's exactly that. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. The only time you will have a difficult conversation is when it actually matters to, you know, team cohesion, performance, whatever it is. And you just literally, there's a pattern there that you have to. Uh, and, and the other point about it is, like we said, with the, you, you have to stay in your circle of influence. You can't change everybody's opinion. But you better be acting on the, where you have influence. Like, so there's a circle of concern. That's, uh, this is Covey's work and the circle of influence. All of us have a circle of concern. All the things we're worried about. Some of the noise. All things we're worried about. And then all of us have a smaller circle of influence. Things we can actually do, th do something about. And if you're going to get dragged out into your circle of concern, I mean, that's not uh, in Covey's work on highly effective people. He said highly effective people put their energy where they have influence. And because they do that over and over and over again, their influence expands. As people come to realize Dave's a guy who gets things done, Gives a guy who doesn't worry about stuff he can't affect. And so if you put your energy into your influence, and so let's say the team would know, we have influence over our training, we have influence over the way we talk to the media, we have influence over certain things, other things we can't influence. And nowadays, the social media scenario, like talk about circular concern, it's, it's, an ex, it's a universe of concern. Every idiot with a, with a phone has a view. Uh, don't be too disparaging there, you know, but, but like seriously? But then there are, you know, so it's, it's just get in there, get tight there. What's our circle of influence here? Yeah. 
And you know, it came up in the leadership group yesterday. Some of you would have been at the leadership session. You know, waiting for the system to change, or actually changing the piece of the system you're at, you're in. Getting a few people who think like you together and actually changing. That's got some agency in it. That's got some power in it. Hoping that the leaders understand things and change things. It's kind of giving away your power. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry, but the, the last bit is though that the, the overlap is that the player gets, it's, it's the player now who's, or the players who are, who are being influenced by the, the other coach. Yeah. And also happens, having to be influenced by me. So now it's affecting us. That's the overlap. We're into a conversation now. So another coach is affecting a player is inside your program. Yeah. So another coach is affecting a player. If the player is affected and it's your player, now we have a conversation with the other coach. Because there's an impact and you have leverage. Yeah. But if it's just noise and the player said, he's, he's, I'm not worrying about him, da da da, no problem. Uh, like in your life generally, guys, work out where you can influence. Where do you have leverage in your life generally? So, you know, I've, I've got good leverage with my three children, so I better be putting lots of attention into my children, because I've got some leverage left with my children. They're adults, but I'm still, I'm still leveraging them. Um, I've got leverage in my work to some extent. So I put a lot of energy in there. Um, I can control Donald Trump's tweets. I got no leverage there. Uh, neither can he. <laughs> you say, I can control lots of things in the world. Uh, you know, that are really big. Um, but many, many people working with leverage on the things they can control can become a movement that actually has a bigger leverage. And in many ways, collaborations around the environment or all around the world will have to connect up for us to impact climate change. Lots of people taking the leverage that they can have. Or we can just look at the problems and lament. So leverage is, is critical into that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what, what I hope you can do, guys, we've got 15 minutes left, so what I'd love you to get a chance to do is try to find language yourself around how you would start a difficult conversation. So de developing uh, an opening statement, for example, if you were trying to give a message to a coach or to an athlete, say, you could go coach, coach, you could go whatever, that was, what would your opening statement be to remind them that there was a campfire? Like what? What could you say? And you can actually think of a specific example. I'm, I'm dealing with an athlete. She's very talented, but she's not paying attention to some important things at the moment. What would your opening statement be to make sure that she was respected and challenged in the same space? Or, and this is an or if you prefer, but this might be, so a conversation goes pear-shaped on you. You're in a conversation, it's going okay, you've started okay, but all of a sudden they get angry with you or they begin to really, you know, uh, lose purpose or respect. How do you say a time, what's a timeout statement you could use? And like literally, I mean, in your own language, something as simple as, uh, Brendan, I'm going to ask for a timeout here. Because at the moment, the conversation is not going to lead us anywhere because we're starting to lose respect for each other. We're starting to lose sight of, of what we're trying to do together. And I just want us to breathe now and think differently because we, we can still resolve this, but not if we stay in this spirit. They're just those kind of statements. Because then you're ready when that situation occurs just to time out, name the emotion, and come back in. Um, or you might decide, I'd like to have a form of words when I finish a tough conversation that actually says, um, I'm really proud of us, mate. Like, that was really awkward for us because uh, we've got a long history and we've, we've worked well, and that was a tough, tough, tough conversation we've just had. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that we had the courage uh, and the commitment to have it, and 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 we're on a good track again here. You know, flagging future connection. So those are three sort of statements you should have in your armory. And I just want to give you a chance for a few minutes just to play around with the, with, with the, one of those statements, whichever one you think. Um, what sort of language you put around that? Um, there's one other last thing, and I'm, I might just put this in before we finish in case we don't get it done. And that's just when somebody ambushes you. You know you're in a conversation, you're well prepared for it, you've got your data clear, and all of a sudden, the ambush happens. Bang. So what an ambush does, shuts down the space. All of a sudden, we was in a room with you, now I'm in a phone box with you. There's no room. 
It's right up there. You know, you're in a, a fight flight freeze, adrenaline kicks in. You can't have an elaborate process in an ambush. You've got to have a very simple first step because you haven't got much time here. And you've got to get the room back. You've got to get the space back. And the first step is critical. And we use the metric IBM. That doesn't stand for the computer company. That stands for Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. <laughs> That's what the ambush feels like, right? <laughs> Bang, all of a sudden. The first thing to do in an ambush, and as long as it's respectful, if it's not a respectful ambush, you can just say, no, I'm sorry, we don't talk like that to each other. Yeah. But if it's sort of a respectful ambush, to come at you, they're angry, but there's a reason, you know, it's okay, it's reasonable. Believe it or not, the best thing you can do is ask them to ambush you again. Because think about it. Think of their energy. I'm going to show you. They've come at you. You know, those anybody do Aikido, uh, martial arts? They've come at you. What they're expecting is for you to come back at them. They're ready for that. Or, or, or collapse. Surrender. And when you've actually asked them to come again. So... Jesus, there's a lot of heat in that, right? There's passion in this for you that I don't understand fully. Can you tell me some more? Right? Ask them to say it again in some form. So what's the worst thing's going to happen? Okay, maybe they'll shoot you again. But you're already on the way to the hospital. We've called for the ambulance. You know you're going to get two wounds fixed. Right? You, you've, yeah, okay, some people will actually go again. They'll balance and go again. But you heard it, actually. So you're okay. Because the second time is different. But more typically what happens when people are asked to sit, they'll reframe slightly. They'll say, geez, I look down, I'm really fed up. I, I feel like I've said this to you a number of times. They'll start to reframe slightly, generally speaking. And the point of all that is so that you can breathe. Because what happens in an ambush is you lose your breath, you lose your center. Adrenaline decenters us. Uh, and so you just want a breath. Because from breath we can work. And when we're ready, we've had our breath. They've gone on with their second ambush. Had our breath. Come into the conversation. Come into the conversation with a statement that restores. Say, that's, it's hard to hear. Um, what are we trying to resolve here? Get the campfire come forward with something that establishes some mutuality. So IBM, I've tested it, uh, this little simple technique. So I, I got a message from the World Cup last year, two years, maybe three years ago now, from an inter a, a national rowing program. And of all the, I'd spent hours with this coach and coach and hours and hours and hours. The message I got back from, the, from Austria whenever the world champs were on was, um, we got this many medals, uh, thanks for your support probably send that message to lots of people. Uh, but in his PS at the bottom line was um, IBM, bloody marvelous. Because he said several times inside the pressure of competition, he felt like reacting to an ambush by just murdering somebody. You know, he's such a big, tough guy. And his instinctive response is just to slaughter the person who ambushes him. You think that's a knife. This is a knife, right? He's that guy. And he said, I just talk myself down I gave them a chance to say it, I stayed centered, and I came forward, and we got better outcomes. So, you know, in practice, in pressure, it can be very, very helpful. Okay? Simple technique, sounds like, but you all know what ambushes are like. Try it out. Send me an email uh, if it works for you, you know, because over time you can get better at not letting the room get shut down on you. So can I just get you a... Uh, Shane, we've got about seven minutes left. So can I just give you a chance just to talk a little bit around maybe a statement? What might you say? Because uh, my language or the language of coaches from somewhere else is, is their language, but your language is probably more important. And pick one of those and possibly just what I might say is what. Yeah. Have a bit of a... Yes, please. This is all because you want to have a conversation. Yes. The, the alternative is to... Write yes, so the alternative is to write something like an email yeah, or uh, sure. whatever. Yeah. The, the, the difficulty is nowadays that most of what you've experienced from my words today <coughs> have been supplemented by my physicality. And when you write something, the tone 
and the body language is not in the writing. And we don't want that. Well, 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 you're a very skillful man. <laughs> <laughs> we want your body language. Um, except that it's how people make meaning. Like they say in, in point zero four of a second, we work out is this a friend or a foe. Like not that long ago, we had to make a very quick judgment and we're used to making meaning from the totality of like the medium is part of the message in, in the old saying. And maybe if you feel that you're angry with somebody, maybe you want to strip away the tone of voice, the body language, and just put something very clean and dispassionate. That could be a situation. But if you're trying to build and restore relationship, um, in some of the business I work in, they say if it's longer than four lines, it's a conversation. Because it starts to become too many ways they can interpret you in an email. And, and if it's longer than four lines, if it can be really crisp and clear and it can be done in four lines, I'm, four lines is their message. It's not, there's no magic number here. But if it's longer than four lines, you should probably be picking up the phone at least because that gives them the tone of your voice. Or having a meeting because that gives them both the tone and your, you know, your generosity. In. And you don't know how to read them. You've delivered a message, but you don't know what they've experienced. So you're sitting happily thinking, beautiful, done it. They're crying. Or yeah. they're angry. But when you are writing, you will have time to think about how you're going to say, what you're going to say, and so on. And That's so when you're writing, it's clarifying for you. And that might be a really good way of getting the critical message clear in your own head. What would I need to say to this person? If the writing can hold it, fine. Uh, and and, and like this is what I'm saying, there's no recipe. This is an approach. Different things will work in different circumstances. Thank you. Anyway, sorry, yes? So we talked about having a conversation, but what if the other party refuses to be, or they just avoid, or they walk out of the room, and then how do you take it from there? So the other person refuses to meet with you? I mean, or they walk out of the room during a meeting. If they walk out of the room during a meeting, that's okay, uh, because we can reconvene. We can say, look, whatever was wrong in that room doesn't have to be in the next room. How would you like to meet? Because I still want to have that conversation. Now, I mean, if you're in leadership, you know, they would have to say, I don't accept your leadership to refuse to come into the room with you. And that's a significant thing for people to say, I do not accept you as my coach. That's a significant thing, thing for them to say. Um, so that goes back to what I was saying before about social media. They don't accept you. Your authority or your expertise as a coach. Because it's been on. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. They would never have a conversation with you. Sorry, sorry. They would never have a conversation with you about that or after that? With me at all because of that. Because they don't accept you as a national coach. I'm trying to connect these two questions together, make sure I do justice to both if I can. Um, my, my is actually more of a, let's say the head coach versus, uh, not versus, but head, head coach trying to tell something to one of the assistants. Or assistant the, coach, head coach, coach assistant coach. And just say a little bit more then. Like, um, let's say our program is heading in this direction, but one of the assistant coaches is doing something else, and yep. he's like, hey, you need to come back here. Yep. But if they refuse to leave, then how do you go from there? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> in many ways, that's the, like, you see, I, I'll just, I'll come back to <laughs> Another acronym, CPR, do you have that acronym? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We're going to have to resuscitate a relationship here. Um, the first time we're going to be talking content, in all these conversations, we go in on data, on the content. But if that lead yields nothing, you go in on pattern, you go in and say, no, I'm just like, we've had this conversation or similar ones a number of times now, and nothing has changed. So we escalate. I need more acceptance than that. And if you get no acceptance, or you get pretend acceptance and they don't do it, you get pretend acceptance and they don't do it. The third time you talk about a relationship, you say, uh, you fundamentally, by your actions are demonstrating that you do not want to be in relationship professionally with me in this program. 
Are you clear that that's what you're saying? So you escalate, and you talk about relationship and the damage that it's doing now. That the the the, um, the contract, the social contract between a senior coach or a head coach and an assistant coach, you are now breaking the scene, the contract. As a contract, to the best of my ability, I will take you in on decision making. At the end of the day, I'll make some calls too. And at the moment, you're deciding to to, to breach that part of the contract. So, nth degree, I can talk, but at the end of the day, you make this decision and you want to sever this relationship. I mean, so you have a little bit of an escalation, I mean, a big escalation, really. Uh, and, and if somebody still stays out of it, I mean, really and truly, that is, a, that is a person who is not going to be good for your culture. And the next conversation we've made, okay, how do I support you in not being here? <laughs> what do you would like me to do to support you in not being here? Uh, because our values and our agreement are this. Your behaviors and our conversations are this. If you know somebody who's recruiting for what you're doing at the moment, I'm happy to give you a reference. But inside our culture, these expectations need to be... Sorry, Dave, I didn't pick... Is that... Is that yeah, okay. Um, I think our time is almost up, guys, but I didn't really stay with that. We need a five minutes to We have that time just to give you a chance just to talk to each other a little bit, just to come decompress a bit and, and take the bits. Maybe if you don't do the activity, it's on the sheet for you anyway. Even if you just want to say to the person next to you, a key thing for you, a key point for you. So we've done, covered a lot of territory here, guys. I hope it hasn't been too fast. But but a key thing that you're going away thinking about, just share that with the person next to you. And when you get the slides, the activity is something you can construct the language at, at another time. Thanks for those questions. Like, that's really helpful to me. The answer would help on you. A little bit. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Um, thank you for all the questions and, and so on. I hope there was enough in there. The slides hopefully capture it and remind you of the things that you wanted to remember. Um, your questions are powerful and strong and, and obviously you're very skillful in, in the way you think about these things. Hopefully though there's something up there that will actually help you. Just to sharpen the blade slightly and just be a little bit more skillful in one or two areas. And if that's the outcome, then 
great because you know 30 of us will be having the right conversations in the right way and, and building performance and building connection and building joy and, and respect into our programs uh, through, through being a bit more skillful in this space. Take care of yourselves and thanks for the privilege of working with you. So before we, we leave today, right, um, can I get you guys as you go out to scan your phone on the QR code uh, over there and uh, fill in the feedback form for us and uh, you can actually go back to uh, our lunch to the uh, area outside of Barra Hall. So at 2.15pm, we're going to have a panel discussion uh, with the three keynote speakers. So other uh, our head ask, the other two. ask questions to yeah. the other two. <laughs> 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 you, I don't, you get your questions, get it. <laughs> and uh, I will encourage you guys also to uh, log into Slido if you didn't manage to log in yesterday. The code is C4222. C4222. So if you have any questions that you haven't yet been able to ask, you can actually log in your questions uh, right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.